Okay, so this is going to be another short one, uh, but this is an important, another important convergence test to internalize. <clears throat> now, we have seen that the harmonic series diverges, uh, the sum of all the reciprocals. However, as it happens, if we alternate the signs of the terms of the harmonic series, then that's actually enough to get it to converge instead. So whereas the harmonic series diverges, the alternating harmonic series, so notice it's still a harmonic series, but I just put an alternator on the top so that the signs alternate between positive and negative. As it happens, that actually converges. And it, it's not terribly hard to see why this is the case. So as I... Uh, allude to here, I have a geometric argument to sort of show why this guy is going to converge. <clears throat> so, so here, here we are in GeoGebra. So we have a unit square. So this is a square where the side length is one. And then I have written line segments here at one half here at one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, one seventh, one eighth, one ninth, one tenth, and then imagine that it keeps on going forever so that the bottom of this square is just filled in completely with lines. Uh, and it's never going to go below that, right? Because I'm always taking fractions. So one one hundredth and, and so on and so on forever. So I'm filling it up with lines. So, uh, let's think about the partial sums of the alternating harmonic series. The first partial sum is 1. So that is the area of this entire square. It's just 1, because the side length here is 1. The second partial sum is 1 minus 1 half. So, because this line segment here is at 1 half, the area of this rectangle, the area of that rectangle is one half. So the second partial sum is one minus one half. So that is the area of this rectangle here that has been shaded in. It's one, the entire square, minus one half, which is this rectangle. So this shaded rectangle here represents the second partial sum. The area of this shaded rectangle is the second partial sum. Okay, what about the third partial sum? So that's one minus one half, so this rectangle, plus one third. So because this line is here at one third, we are now adding on the area of this rectangle. Okay, the fourth partial sum is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third minus 1 fourth. Well, 1 fourth is the area of this rectangle. So, 1 third minus 1 fourth gives us the area of this strip. Okay? So the area of this strip is 1 third minus 1 fourth. So the fourth partial sum altogether is the area of this rectangle plus the area of this rectangle, the two shaded regions. Okay, well, we can keep on going like this. The sixth partial sum is going to be the area of the one, two, three shaded rectangles. The um, eighth partial sum is going to be the area of these first four shaded rectangles. The tenth partial sum is going to be the area of the five shaded rectangles. And you can imagine that this pattern is going to continue ad infinitum. So the partial sums are given by adding up the areas of these little strips for the alternating harmonic series. So that means that the partial sums, if you were to focus on just the even numbered ones, which is fine. Uh, that's an increasing sequence, because every additional partial sum adds on another strip. So it's an increasing sequence 
Furthermore, uh, they are always going to be bounded by one, because no matter how many strips I put in, it's always going to be stuck inside of this square. So the total area of all of these strips is never going to exceed one. So that means the sequence of partial sums is increasing, but it's also bounded. That means it has to converge. That was the, uh, the monotonic sequence theorem, or something like that. But intuitively, I think it's clear, because the, the actual sum of the alternating harmonic series would be the sum of the areas of all of these strips, and, you know, continue adding them on forever. And surely that has to exist, because it's not going to exceed the area of the square that it's all uh, stuck inside. So that's sort of my reasoning for why this dude converges. That's my, uh, that's my proof of it. Um, there is a more general proof uh, in the book, but I think this captures the core of the argument. So in general, uh, this is going to apply anytime you have an alternating, ser an alternating series where B sub N, so the terms whose signs are being alternated, satisfy the following conditions. They're always positive, they are going to zero, and they are eventually decreasing. If all of these things are uh, satisfied, then the alternating series is going to converge. So that's very useful. And basically it means that any time you see a series that has an alternator in front of it, you should immediately think, oh, let's do the alternating series test. So this gives us a, a very robust way of handling the convergence of alternating series. Notice, however, that the alternating series test can only give us convergence. If any of these things are not satisfied, then who knows? Right? It might converge, it might diverge. The test tells us nothing about that situation. It can only give us convergence. Okay, so in this example, we have a series that has an alternator in front of it, and then the b sub n would be n squared over n cubed plus 1. So this is a perfect candidate to look at the alternating series test. And basically, let's just look at these terms, n squared over n cubed plus 1, and see if they satisfy the three required uh, conditions. So, one, are they positive? Well, yeah, clearly. n squared is always going to be positive. n cubed might not be positive, but n is starting at one and it's only getting larger from there. So the cube of a positive number is still positive, And of course, adding one isn't going to change that. So clearly these are all positive. What about the limit? So the limit as n goes to infinity of n squared over n cubed plus 1. Well, this is a rational function, right? We have a polynomial on top and on the bottom. The degree of the numerator is 2. The degree of the denominator is 3. So that means the denominator is the dominant term, and that pulls it all down to zero. Which indeed is what we, what we wanted to see. So this limit is zero because the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. Finally, we have to show that the sequence is eventually decreasing. So to do that, uh, what we can do is we can take the derivative and show that the derivative is eventually negative. So 
So uh, we're going to have to use the quotient rule. So let's see. It's low d high minus high d low over low squared. And I'm writing x's instead of n's because in order for the derivative to make sense, the domain has to consist of real numbers. And if you're writing n, that sort of implies that the domain consists of only integers. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Point is, I'm taking the derivative of this dude. And I want to show that this guy is a negative. So let's see. Uh, the denominator, well, not much we can do about that. However, because it is a quantity squared, the denominator is always going to be positive. So if this guy is going to be negative, it's going to have to be because of something happening in the numerator. Uh, so let's clean that up a bit. So distributing the 2x, and then distributing, well, just multiplying these guys, 3x to the fourth, uh, and 2 minus 3, so I can combine the like terms. Yep. 2x to the fourth minus 3x to the fourth is minus 1. Okay. So, in the numerator, we have a, a an x term and we have an x to the fourth term. Well, the x to the fourth term is clearly the dominant term. So, when x is large, the x to the fourth term is going to be the one that controls the sign. So indeed, because the x to the fourth term is negative, that means that when x is large, this numerator is going to be negative because it's dominated by, by, by this term here. So when x is large, uh, the numerator is negative, the denominator is positive, which means the whole thing is negative. So the derivative is eventually negative, which means that the series, or I'm sorry, the sequence is, you know, the sequence of terms which go into the series uh, is eventually decreasing. So the premises of the alternating series test are satisfied, uh, which means that the series converges, right? It only gives us convergence, can't give us anything else. Okay, what about this dude? Well, once again, we have an alternator, negative one to the n. Doesn't matter if it's n plus one or n, that only means all that's going to change is whether it starts with a negative sign or a positive sign, but it's still gonna be alternating. Uh, so here we have our alternator and our b sub n is gonna be three n over four n minus one. So let's check the premises of the alternating series test. First off, are they positive? Uh, yeah, clearly. I mean, 4n minus 1, that minus 1 might make it negative, but who cares? I mean, n starts at 1 and it only gets bigger from there. So yeah, this guy is eventually positive. I mean, not even eventually. You plug in n equals 1, and you get 3, and then it only gets bigger from there. But just to hedge our bets, I'll say eventually. Because it only needs to be eventually positive. You can cut out the first you know, billion terms or whatever, and that, that's not going to change whether it converges or not. Uh, so clearly, it's eventually positive. What about the limit? 
Hmm. Well, here's where we're going to run we're going to run into a problem. So if we take the limit of this dude as n goes to infinity, well, it's a rational function. The degree on the top is 1, the degree on the bottom is also 1. Well, when the degrees are the same, then the limit is going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients. So, it is not 0, so the alternating series test does not apply. Now, in this case, what can we say, though? Because we have an alternator, and then we have a bunch of terms which are eventually going to 3 fourths. So if we look at the limit of the terms themselves, including the alternator, we will see that they are eventually going to be ping-ponging between positive 3 fourths and negative 3 fourths. But remember the divergence test. Uh, if a series is going to converge, then the limit of the terms has to be zero. But that's not the case. In this case, the terms are going to be ping-ponging between three-fourths and negative three-fourths. So the limit straight up doesn't exist. So the divergence test tells us that this uh, series is going to be divergent. So recall the divergence test. which states that uh, which states that if the limit as n goes to infinity of the terms of a series is not zero or doesn't exist, then the corresponding series uh, diverges. In our case, right, so notice now I am taking the limit of the entire thing, not just the bit uh, uh, that you get upon, upon taking away the alternator. So in our case, this limit does not exist because it will eventually be alternating between values close to uh, three-fourths and values close to negative three-fourths. So you know, if the terms of a sequence are alternating forever, then that limit doesn't exist. It, it doesn't go to a limit. So we conclude that this dude diverges by the divergence test, not by the alternating series test. I want to make that clear. Right, the alternating series test doesn't say anything about divergence. All it can tell us is if a series converges. But if these premises are not satisfied, if any one of these premises are not satisfied, then it could be the case that this guy diverges. It could still be the case that this converges. Um, although, to be fair, if, if this middle condition is not satisfied, then I think it's always going to diverge because of the divergence test. But, like, if this guy isn't satisfied, for instance, then it might still converge. And we don't know. But anyway, yeah, I just wanted to point out that the conclusion here follows from the divergence test, not the alternating series test. Okay, so already that covers pretty much all there is to say about the alternating series test. I mean, you look at a series, it's got an alternator in it. So either the premises of the alternating series test are, are satisfied, in which case you're done, 
or they're not, in which case you would have to look at a different test. Um, most likely the divergence test, but you know it could be it could be something else entirely that's needed. However, one other thing that we can say uh, is we can use uh, uh, we we have we have an estimation theorem. We can actually get a handle on the size of the remainder in the case of an alternating series. So remember, uh, last time we were looking at this was on the sec was in the section on the integral test. So suppose that you have an infinite series and you want to approximate the value of this thing by adding up, say, the first k terms and then neglecting the rest. Well, then the remainder or the error in that approximation is the sum of the remaining terms. So r sub k, by definition, is the error incurred in approximating a sum with, with k terms. So in the case of the alternating harmonic series, so this is the example that we started with, it is not too hard to see via our geometric argument that, for example, this the remainder upon taking the second partial sum is smaller than one third. So, okay, so the remainder upon taking the second partial sum is smaller than one third. Why is this true? Well, remember what the uh, um, what the significance of these rectangles is. This first rectangle is the second partial sum, or rather the area of this rectangle is the second partial sum. So the remainder upon taking the second partial sum is the area of all of these additional strips. Okay? So the, the full sum is the area of all of the strips, all the way at down to infinity. The remainder is the area of all of the strips except for a couple of them. So r sub 2, so, so if the second partial sum is this rectangle alone, then the remainder, r sub 2, is going to be the area of all of these rectangles. Well, all of these rectangles are below the line, which is at one third, right? This is at one, this is at one half, this is at one third. So the remainder is entirely contained within this rectangle whose area is one third. Well, that's exactly what I've said. The remainder is smaller than one third because the area of all those strips is contained within the rectangle, uh, uh, which takes up one third of the square. And one third in this case is b sub three, because b sub n in this case is just one over n. Similarly, the remainder upon taking the fourth partial sum, so upon taking the fourth partial sum, uh, our estimate is gonna be these first two rectangles, in that case, the remainder is going to be these rectangles, and these are all contained within the rectangle at one fifth. So one, one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth. So that means the remainder is smaller than one fifth. Okay, which is the same as b sub five. And indeed, you can keep on making this uh, uh, observation ad infinitum, and the pattern is that the remainder of, I mean, I'm only looking at even numbers here, so the remainder of the whatever th partial sum is just one over whatever plus one, right? So this is one over two plus one, one over four plus one, one over whatever plus one. So in particular, it is the next term of the series, which gives you a bound on the remainder. And indeed, this observation holds in general. Whenever you are looking at an alternating series, which verifies, or uh, which satisfies the premises of the alternating series test. So suppose this guy satisfies the premises. So positive, limit at zero, and eventually decreasing. Well, then, the remainder upon taking the kth partial sum is going to be smaller than the k plus one-th term of the, of the series, neglecting the alternator. 
So that's a, that's a very nice result. It's, it's very easy to do computations with. Uh, it's very, very easy to compute error bounds in this case. So find the sum of this series correct to three decimal places. Okay, so first off, uh, if we want to use the estimation theorem, we have to verify that this satisfies the premises of the alternating series test. So here, b sub n is equal to 1 over n factorial. So, you know, it's whatever you get when you neglect the alternator. Uh, and, well, it's, it's clear. Clearly these are positive. Clearly it's decreasing, because n factorial is certainly increasing, but it's taking the reciprocal of that. Uh, and tending towards 0. Right, because n factorial explodes to infinity, 1 over infinity is 0. So, by the estimation theorem, we have that the absolute value of the remainder upon taking the first k uh, 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 terms of the series is less than or equal to You know what? I'm a little bit worried here. I'm a little bit worried because here in the statement of the theorem, the starting point is 1. Here, the starting point is 0. So you know what? Let's fix that. This isn't a very big deal, but I, 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 should, I should mention it anyway. So to use the estimation theorem, change the starting point from n equals 0 to n equals 1. So this isn't too hard. So here's a general rule. If you want to increase the starting point by 1, then decrease everything else by 1. So decrease this by 1 to get n minus 1, decrease this by 1 to get n minus 1 factorial. And there we go. So this is maybe a, a nice thing to know about. It'll certainly become maybe a bit more useful uh, in the next few sections. So if you want to increase the starting point by 1, you have to decrease every instance of the index by 1. And it goes the other way around as well. If you want to decrease the starting point, then that means you have to increase the index. And you know, it's not too hard to see, you just work out a few examples uh, why this is true. Okay, anyway, so now that the starting point is 1, uh, Now we have b sub n equals 1 over n minus 1 factorial. I mean, this is all still true, so who cares? The, the, premises, of, the premises of the alternating series test are still satisfied. I mean, you're not going to change that by just incrementing the index. So by the estimation theorem, we have the remainder upon taking the first k terms is less than or equal to b sub k plus 1. So that is 1 over uh, k minus 1 plus 1, right? Because I'm using this formula now. So whatever, that's just k. Yeah, so there you go. So there is the bound on our remainder. Uh, okay, so what are they actually asking us? 
we want to find the sum correct to three decimal places. So we're going to have to add up a whole bunch of terms. The question is, how many terms do we add up? Well, we want to add up just enough so that the error is smaller than, well, so that the error is doesn't affect the first three decimal places. So, uh, one way to ensure that the first three decimal places are going to be unaffected is if the error is smaller than 0 0.0001, right? Because then the first three decimal points are, are indeed unaffected. Well, one way to ensure that the error is that small is to ensure that the error bound is that small. So I should say Okay. So now this is the question. Uh, what is the smallest value of k for which 1 over k factorial is smaller than 0 0.0001? Uh, and because we can't really solve this inequality, so to speak, uh, pretty much all we need to do now is just start plugging in numbers. And because the factorial grows really, really quickly, uh, this should happen pretty fast. So, what is the smallest integer k satisfying this inequality. Well, start plugging in numbers. So starting at 1, 1 over 1 factorial is 1. Well, that's not going to do it. Well, I don't need to, I don't think I need to specify that much. So 2 factorial is just 2, so that's 1 half. One sixth is, um, so hang on, let me break out my calculator. And I'm going to take it to four decimal places because that's the smallest amount of precision that I need. Uh, four factorial is four times six, so that's 24. Okay. Uh, that's 1 over 120. So we're getting there. Next is uh, 720. Oh, we're getting there, so the next one might be it. We want this to be smaller than 0 0.0001. Next is 5040. Almost. 
So the next one's going to do it. <laughs> yeah, the next one's going to do it for sure. This is after rounding, incidentally. Four oh three. Four oh three twenty. Okay. Okay, so that does it. This is certainly smaller than um that. So we take K to be eight. Eight or larger. So that means we add up the first eight terms. And well, let's just go ahead and do this in GeoGebra. So what was it again? Minus one to the n minus one and minus one factorial. So let's go over and do this in GeoGebra. And let's get a little more precision. 0. 0.6321. Cool. Okay, so apparently this is correct to within the first three decimal places. So actually, yeah, <laughs> let's just let's just keep that. So so yeah. So this sum is 0.632, and then beyond that, who knows? But these first three terms we can say with complete confidence. That's kind of neat. Okay, so that's all that I have to say about this section. <laughs>